So good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Renee Moodley, as, as you mentioned, uh, Head of IT and Operations for JSC Private Placements. That's basically JSC's new disruptive business. But I think we're excited to be here as the first panel. We have an exhilarating lineup in terms of questions and comments from the team. But I think as we go through the full agenda, I think, you know, reserve your comments because we're going to actually spend some time at the end uh, taking your comments from, from the audience. So there's going to be a little bit of a quiz. <laughs> Uh, so let's get stuck in. Uh, we've got such a beautiful agenda in terms of talking about Web 3.0 and the future of the internet, but I think the best way to start is really to understand what Web 3.0 is. So I want to look to my, you know, my panel members and say, <coughs> let's, let's give the audience some sort of context in terms of what Web 3.0 is. Uh, up to anybody to jump in. One go in order. <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> <laughs> um, okay, so... Good Google search will give you kind of a high-level view on Web 3.0. Um, it's an idealistic view on what the internet could be. Um, talks about using blockchain, decentralized ledgers, uh, moving from a fiat-based currency to cryptocurrency, things like that. Um, so you can get a really good sense of what Web 3.0, like I say, on the internet. Um, but I, th I think what's really important is what does 3.0 mean for your different organization, what does it mean for you personally. Um, for me, it's more of a, a vision statement of what could be. Uh, it's it's a John Lennon imagine, you know, what the life, what world could be. Um, it's, it's, it's a demand-based change in the environment. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's people going, hey, it can be done better um, and someone putting out that vision statement um, of what it could be. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Malloy or Rala Bepa, oh. any comments uh, to add to that potentially? Um, I think it's not complicated. It's yes. where we are now. If you look at, I think just think blockchain technology, um, that just think AI, and um, that's, that's the space we we. we operating in, it's more the internet talking to you than you talking to the internet, really. Excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent. It's well covered. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I totally agree, I totally agree. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Poji, I think coming back to you, uh, you know, based on the general description of Web 3.0, how feasible is it for companies to pursue Web 3.0 as a strategic advantage? <clears throat> yeah, so, so the problem is, it is a dream, it's a vision statement. So feasibility is an important question. So, you know, in the end of the day, your feasibility is determined by the demand of your customers, demand of your organization, um, and where you can gain benefit from the different components. So to look at Web 3.0 as a vision statement that you will go for and 100% achieve all of it, it's, it's not feasible. Um, uh, just to put an example, if you had to change the fiat money system to a crypto-based digital currency right now, you'd need four times the entire world's energy to achieve that. It's wow. not possible. Um, so you've got to look at this in isolated use cases um, and understand uh, AI is the buzz of the world at the moment, uh, generative AI, uh, G GPT and all that. Every meeting you go to, someone mentions it in some shape or form. Um, even non-technology meetings, the, the truth is you need to look at the specific use cases and identify, I come from an architectural background, um, architecture is a, uh, is a um, world of trade-offs, understanding um, opportunities and problem statements and then deciding on, a, on solutions and between different solutions there's trade-offs. So understanding one, why you're doing it is the most important thing. Um, from there, then take a view of, okay, well, is, is this in line with our progression as a vision statement? It is a good guide. Web 3.0 is a really good guide to understanding what the wider global community is looking for. It came from somewhere. They're looking for that innovation. They're looking for that disruption. Um, but you, it really gets down to the point is, is it feasible? Have a look at the different components. Is it feasible for you to drive AWS SageMaker for intensive AI across insights, across 
every single component of your business? No. You'd be out of business in a day because it would cost you so much. Um, but the key component, key use cases can be a 10x driver of, 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 of growth in your market. So it's, it all comes down to the understanding the individual use cases. Oh, that's amazing. And I think keeping to your point around feasibility, uh, Mr. Malloy, in terms of your sector around looking at manufacturing and mining, I mean, how, does, how do you see digitizing sort of impacting that domain? Yeah, no, th thanks very much, Rene. I mean, we coming from the mining ma manufacturing sector, we have found ourselves having to be, you know, in the forefront sometimes in terms of how we develop the technology, driven mainly by safety, you know, in the, in the mining space. And I mean, if we look at what's been done recently from the collision prevention systems, where we're looking at how machines can almost like uh, go autonomous or even fail to stop in terms of making sure that the, safe, the mines are safe. But in all of that, one of the key things that we've also realized is the integration of technology with the manufacturing sector and the mining sector. I mean, between the programs that we run at the, the Mandela Mining Precinct in collaboration with the CSIR is looking at the programs like real-time information management, which is w looking at what's happening in real time in the mines, and then looking also at, uh, at, at you know, successful application of technology centered around people. You know, I think one of the speakers mentioned earlier on where they were showing a, a grader saying, some people are sitting there saying, that thing, you know, it's gonna one day control itself, I might be jobless. And I think the key thing around that, around the set cap, program which is run by the Mandela Mining Precinct is really to say people shouldn't be afraid of technology. We should embrace it as the future but also looking at how in time we can repurpose all the people that are going to be affected by technology. So from our side as, as the manufacturers and look at the mining industry in general, is, yes we have to embrace technology. Uh, mining is getting deeper, it's getting more expensive, it's getting more dangerous so you know the best way to integrate learnings also is look at how best we can use issues like blockchain to put data into a central place so you don't have to reinvent uh, uh, what something happened somewhere in South Africa or South America. And I think blockchain could be one of those drivers that could actually help us in that space. Thank you. Yes, no, that's excellent. And I think I totally concur. I mean, looking, keeping the JSE hat on, I mean, from a capital markets perspective, we're also seeing the same in terms of what is the impact. I mean, we've set up a new business called JSC Private Placements to look at how do we sort of utilize blockchain? How do we utilize clever algorithms? And so the last 12 months, we've been able to put some of that tech to play. And, uh, you know, so it's an exciting space to be for everyone to join in. And uh, so in our space, just if I may deviate for a second saying, we're looking at not just in the listed market, but now unlisted market. So very exciting in terms of raising private listings, private uh, capital, raising private investors in terms of individuals or institutions. So I think it's an exciting space that we all want to sort of leapfrog to. And I think uh, it's something that I think we, from a panel perspective, are quite excited to be involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to Ms. Ralebepa, uh, a question for you in terms of keeping us honest on the guide rails of regulation. Uh, how can organizations ensure effective governance and risk management in the era of Web 3.0 and evolving the internet landscape? Uh, so the vision of Web 3.0 is decentralization, security, and transparency. These are basically at the core of it all, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and with any emerging technology, um, there are emerging risks um, that companies need to look out for. So I know in most companies, and especially for us tech people, risk management is a swear word because we're thinking we are going to be sitting in a room with a bunch of risk management practitioners asking you about things that will never happen. Um, and I think with the era of um, COVID-19, we've seen more and more cyber attacks. So um, what are, one of the things that, that companies need to look out for is really you need to stay informed. You need to keep yourself informed. You need to keep yourself educated. Um, our keynote speakers um, mentioned the, the question of you know, digital skills. Um, you need to make sure that you have the right people with the right skills. Um, 
The other thing that we need to look out for is developing robust risk management frameworks. Your risk management framework needs to be agile. In most companies, this is a, an exercise that's done once a year so that we can submit it to the board and say, hey, we've done what we need to do. You can't do that with technology because every day things are changing. So your, 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 your risk management um, frameworks need to be robust. And, and there's a lot of um, organizations out there, and I'm going to mention my organization, ISACA, where we, provide, where we are at the forefront of research in terms of any emerging technologies so that we can provide our professionals with frameworks to use in their companies. So you've got your risk management framework, you'll have your cyber security framework, we've got um, at web, in South Africa, we've got the Web3 policy forum that's working um, at looking at uh, Web3 and, and the future. And therefore, you need to make sure that you, know, you look at the, the globally what's happening so that even your organization, you've got the right uh, risk management frameworks. Um, in terms of governance, we know with King now and, and the new ISO, cyber, cyber security is one of the key pillars of your governance framework. And that's something that the board is even looking at. It's not just something that's done at, um, at a compliance level. So those are some of the things that you need to look out for. So I think for me, key thing is your risk management framework must be agile. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself uh, putting out fires instead of anticipating what could possibly happen. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I really concur about the point about agility and sort of finding our space in, in a new domain. And I think, you know, keeping with you, uh, if you look at the key cybersecurity risks and threats, mm -hmm. I mean, what's your take around the challenges and threats to organizations that they should consider? I think one of the, the, the key things is, like I said, you know, you've got... Um, security, mm. supposed security being one of the things that's promised by, by Web3, right? So, but then also if you look at smart contracts, you t you, you've got data that's sitting on blockchain, data that's all over the world. So one of the biggest things obviously is data breaches. Of course. You know, that's one of the, of the, of the key things that we worry about in terms of uh, Web3. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, the regulatory frameworks, your anti-money laundering that you need to be aware of uh, because now you've got, you know, digital assets, so to speak, when, when we're talking now cryptocurrencies and CBDCs. So those things are, um, you know, tra travel your boundaries in a manner of seconds. And therefore, you need to be aware of, you know, the, the regulations such as ML, uh, AML, and I know the Financial Intelligence uh, Center has been working very hard with uh, Saab as well to come up with um, regulations. Um, and that is to protect the, the you know, um, people. I know um, I'm, I'm one of the proponents and I, I love blockchain technology. Um, I, I play in the crypto space. Uh, we, most of us don't like <laughs> centralization. Um, and we, don't, when we also don't like um, regulations, but to some extent that is necessary because there's a lot of people that are getting hurt because uh, we don't want to be centralized. So as much as Web3 is about decentralization, security is very important when it comes to protecting people's assets. Very insightful. Now, thank you so much for that. And I think coming back to Mr. Borgia, uh, if you look at you know, the, the points that we were raised already around challenges, the guide rails around the components that we sit in. I mean, what do you see are the key Web 3.0 components that potentially have business case worthy uh, pursuing angles? Sure. So, I mean, I'm going to talk from an APSA point of view and maybe from a financial, financial sector point of view. Um, again, we've gone back to the, the why. Uh, we've spoken about crypto and things. Why do people want cryptocurrency over the current fiat format? You know, what is that rationale? There's various reasons. There's, there's the, uh, the, the mistrust in banks. 
there's the security side, there's the, the fees and the, and the access to uh, moving money overseas and, and doing all sorts of um, sometimes dodgy things, um, but typically that, that freedom of financial um, aspect. Uh, so rather than uh, just going wholehearted into it, it's, it's, com it's pieces of that. So when you talk about components, crypto is a big portion of it uh, from a digital currency point of view to see where we can improve the banks so that uh, we're not, oh, crypto is no longer as, a, as much of a threat to us um, and play in that space at some point. Um, so we're moving in that world. Um, security is massive. Uh, use of uh, quantum uh, uh, cryptography, for example, is, is, is moving forward. Um, most of us from big corporates take a customer-centric approach, uncompromising security. So um, that is a huge component of where we're moving. Um, we're spending a lot of R&D and innovation um, budget on security, and we will do for the foreseeable future. Um, and then the interaction with client, um, and that's a big thing on Web 3.0 is people are asking for the public internet to change. Why? You know, to make things easier, to get services quicker, to have better control of their lives. So, you know, that digital front end, um, that internet facing, customer facing side of it, how do we improve that on, a, on an ongoing basis? It's never going to be a silver bullet, oh, you've got it perfect from the get go. Again, it gets back to where can you get the most value? Uh, there was mentions of omni channels, there's mentions of all these different things. They're, they're all possible pieces that you can put in and drive that journey forward. So it's, there's a lot of components. You know, it's not just uh, a high level, hey, we're gonna achieve everything. No, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey. Um, and again, uh, AI obviously is the other one. Um, driving insights, uh, deep insights into data, into security, into risk um, and, and product delivery uh, is, is another big one. Um, that, that's probably one of the bigger benefit cases in terms of your, your benefit to customer and your pro underlying profit margins um, and, and, and turnover. Is, uh, that's a 10x changer, is being able to identify what your target market is, who you should be marketing to, increase sales, stuff like that. Um, and not just on a profit level, but as a customer. You know, I've got like two seconds left. Uh, yeah, you get five different messages from different banks or cell phone providers a day. It, it irritates you. That is the, those sort of things are what changes and is driving Web 3.0. It's, it's that irritation with the current model. So if you can solve that in your business using these new components, uh, that's the business case and that's, that's what you should be focusing on and that's what we're focusing on. Yeah, that's perfect. No, I, I love the fact that we're taking you know, our audience through a journey, you know, the journey of understanding what the Web 3.0 is, where's the guide rails, how does this impact like banking, capital markets, and, you know, coming back to you, Mr. Malloy, uh, how do we see that sort of impacting something as in the domain of supply chain? I mean, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Renee. Look, one of the things that we have identified in the mining uh, supply chain is an issue of, um, you know, if you look at the mining companies, you've got some companies using SAP, some using Ariba, some using Cooper. So there's different arrays, but there's one set of, of rules that doesn't change. And in time, time uh, supply chain, we're using the, the UNS, UNSP SC code, the United Nations Standard Products and Services Code. But what tends to happen is whenever that system is set up, it's using those codes, but the minute it starts moving from there's from the end user to the another end user, it starts changing. And there's this thing called free text that tends to be used by a lot of companies in terms of when they buy certain items. And in that, that's where the opportunity is lost of, of consolidating your supply chain power. Because I can call this a, a glass of water, mm -hmm. somebody might call it something else. And I think using that system of uh, the, the UNSPC's codes, is to then look at how that information, and I'll give you a practical example. A company like Sasol Mining in the coal side and Exaro have ventured into a long uh, process of identifying 
uh, where they can localize certain items that they're importing and also looking at streamlining their supply chain in terms of do we have the same thing at different shafts having different names? And in that, the value of then consolidating and making sure that their supply chain is, 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 is um, almost like a smooth running. So the, 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 the issues of blockchain in, in, in the supply chain, I think it will then open it up because it took, say, Sasol three years to identify the, pr the problems and identify the, pro the products that they are importing and what they can, they can localize. It took exactly close to 10 years. And it's just because of how the information, the data has been collated. And I think other minds should not have to go through the same pain if this data, because it's just, I mean, the UNS PC codes are standard. So you don't have to go and reinvent that. But if they sit in a common place so that the other minds can then streamline that. And then also looking at how best we can then use that information to help on the localization side of things, to help industries to, to, to grow. And I think that's where the value of, on the practical side of how we see blockchain using the data that's available to just make things easier. Thank you. I think the one thing that resonates is this type of concepts in terms of blockchain, Web 3.0, humbles us, you know, in terms of <coughs> keeping the R&D going, keeping the collaboration going. Mm. I mean, coming back to even what we're doing in the capital markets space, really is trying to collaborate with industry leaders. You know, we're looking from an Africa perspective, how do we expand, not just the JSE from a South African perspective, but Africa and abroad. And so we're also trying to make some serious footprints there around collaborating with partners like yourselves. Uh, to see how we can work together. Um, so coming back to, to the guide rails, uh, Mr. Ala Pepa, um, just talk to us about how can organizations build trust in Web 3.0 and ensure compliance with evolving through data privacy regulations? You know, I think obviously every organization, if they really do care about uh, uh, being a going concern, would take data privacy serious. Um, I think it's a good thing that you've got GDPR and then you've got uh, Poppy that kind of preceded or um, the, their implementation preceded the implementation and the adapt, 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 adoption of Web3 and therefore we've yes. got regulations in, you know, in that state. So, you know, data privacy is one of the things. And implementing, you know, robust data protection measures. I think, I'm sure 80% um, of you still get those unsolicited phone calls and you really feel sorry for the lady or gentleman at the end of the phone call because they're just doing their jobs. But, you know, they are breaking the law if you didn't give them consent to have your information. Um, I think um, as a mother to young ones, I do feel sorry for them because you know, I, I can imagine my son or daughter at the end of the line sure. uh, just trying to make a living. But um, that doesn't mean that we have to break the law. You know? And so data privacy is one of the, one of the, uh, the big things. Um, I think in principle we should, you know, by design, when you're designing your, your, uh, your Web3, you should think about those controls in place. You know, how you're designing your controls to make sure that you know, um, you, 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 there is data privacy and there is the element of trust. Because I think with a new technology, um, the big thing is that digital trust. Um, we are living in a world where uh, you basically have to operate from a zero trust uh, point of view. Uh, because you never know whether you're speaking to a human at the end of the line or you're speaking to a bot, <laughs> you know. Um, you never know whether your lawyer is human or it's, <laughs> it's an AI. So I think uh, zero trust, but there are regulations, fortunately, in that space. Um, we've got, at, 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 at ISACA, we've got the cybersecurity CSX uh, framework that helps you um, to put controls in place when, when you do your implementation. I mean, there's like NIST uh, framework uh, for those who are in, in cybersecurity profession. And I think uh, those are some of the, of the guidelines that you can use uh, to make sure that um, you protect the privacy and um, also you develop trust in, in, the, in, in the technologies that you are implementing. 
Lovely. And it looks like there's a lot of work that's being done under the hood, and I think the audience mm. can really collaborate, you know, offline uh, to try and see how we can leverage some of those frameworks that you talk about and some of the insights in terms of, you know, banking and mining and ETC, ETC. I guess we don't want to reinvent the wheel. I guess we want to yeah, leverage, true. collaborate. And there's a lot of, uh, as well. I think, our, fortunately, in South Africa, our banking system is quite advanced in terms of regulations. Yes. Um, I think we are at the forefront globally. Uh, in terms of regulation, so and with with most of the financial institutions adopting uh, blockchain, for instance, um, I don't think it's going to be a big ta ask for, particularly the financial sector. Uh, other course. other industries, maybe a little bit of work to be done, but um, I think in in terms of our fin financial um, industry, we are a little bit ahead of of the pack. That's exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bojia, uh, back to you. Um, so from your perspective, you know, what's the risk, uh, what risk is associated with progressing with Web 3.0? And is there a balance that we can find? There's definitely a balance. Uh, there's multiple risks. Um, so it depends where you're looking. There's risks in everything. There's risks coming here today, um, <laughs> especially with the potholes and the gas line. <coughs> um, but in general, uh, we're seeing risks at quite a fundamental layer. I, I mean, I'm obviously in the engineering side, so we see it at the coal face when code hits um, server or, or, or instance. Um, the, we, you put SAS and DAS solutions to use AI to automatically kind of visualize issues in your code when you're building something, for example. But at the end of the day, you, you build a reliance on intelligence sometimes. And what I mean is, uh, we've seen it where uh, immature kind of companies, or uh, teams should I say, uh, rely on chat GPT, uh, underlying uh, intelligence to build out solutions, and then when those solutions go live, yes, they've ticked certain check boxes, and they've been built by this intelligence that's come from the wider world of intelligence, uh, but a senior developer hasn't actually gone through the code and you know, things get into production that shouldn't be into production uh, because they've trusted that technology component rather than having an underlying mature skill that actually has gone through that stuff. And that applies not just to code, but you know, we've legal agreements. Uh, we, our legal department, we put in uh, clause analytics and all sorts of contract reviewing technology that goes through and says, hey, this, this clause is wrong. The problem with that is that you, be, you see a tick on a screen and you go, okay, this is perfectly fine, and you rely on that. And most of the time, the AI confidence rating on what gets ac what's accuracy is better than any human will do. But sometimes there's that gray area where you need someone to actually review it and go through it and say, hold on. Even though it's right, you know, based on the check boxes and the AI that's actually looked at it, you, you need that human aspect to still go and have that intelligence beyond what something's been trained to do um, to actually review it. So don't throw away departments because AI is going to take over. <laughs> review what you're doing. Review that. And that's the biggest risk, is that we, we throw skills out the door that can be used um, for technology. And I'm a pure technologist. I could replace humans like that, I would. Um, no, I'm joking. Maybe just my fiance. <laughs> um, the, but in general, it, it is a, there's a people risk, but that people risk relates into operational risk. So you need to be careful on just going gang, you know, gangbusters with some of this stuff. You need to just take a step back and say, but that human aspect was there for a reason. Um, and that skills development from non-valuable task to valuable task is, is critical. That's where the biggest risk is. Oh, that's amazing. And I think, uh, you know, as you were chatting, I'm just thinking about one of the domains and one of the principles about UAT, mm. uh, user acceptance testing. And, you know, are we going to replace that with RAT, robot acceptance testing? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, interesting concepts, uh, <laughs> but I think that's what's beautiful about where we find ourselves. Coming back to the concept of humility, you know, we even the capital market space went globally and said, how do we learn 
from, from, from a global perspective and the global stage in terms of what's happening in the space. And it was humbling to see that people are actually looking to us mm. uh, to sort of help guide that, that process. And I think that's something to the testament of you know, some of our panel members as well as who's in the audience alike. So I think really exciting space to be and uh, really to sort of leapfrogging uh, in terms of an industry, industry players itself. Um, so I think we've, looking at the time, the ticker is, is going, uh, and I really want to give the audience a chance to sort of ask some questions. So we've sort of encapsulated a very high level, 50,000 foot level view of, you know, what, what is Web 3.0, what's the future hold from an internet perspective. I think there's some rolling mics, but if you guys can put your hands up, if there's any questions and comments, uh, we'd love to take it. Excellent, I see one uh, right here. I don't know if there's a mic running around. <coughs> I see Janita's running uh, precariously. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, one, can you guys hear me? Uh, no, I think give that another try. Of course, okay. we'll, we'll try and repeat if need be. Thanks, everyone. I'm very excited about this. is now coming around to say, how do we put the internet back in the hands of the people that are providing the content and reading the content and all of that stuff? So we also have things like, questions like AI governance, right? Yet, as a species, we've not really done well on governing pretty much anything we've let out of the box. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, around the, around the socio-economic problem, I suppose, and just your thoughts around this, and I suppose, Kabo, this also speaks to the idea of, well, people sell bad products, but where, you know, and we try to manage this with the legal system. So the question is primarily around the human problem, the economic problem, the, the problem of governance and legal in trying to regulate all of this stuff and trying to pigeonhole this to say, well, we want to see good outcomes come from it, because that's what we thought was going to happen with Web 2, right? There's wonderfully great outcomes that can come out from generative AI as well. But as we've seen, once it's unlocked, once it becomes commercially viable, it's very difficult to repackage it and say, okay, don't do direct marketing anymore, right? So I'm curious about your thoughts on this and taking into account things like uh, Europe's GDPR and all of these that are trying to protect consumers. And if this is actually, if, if, if creating these new technologies is actually taking us into a better space or giving us higher caliber rounds for the gun. Thanks. Cool. Excellent. I think, yeah, let's tackle that. I think first and foremost, you know, life has a lot of duality. Technology has a lot of duality. You know, there's the cup half full, half empty logic. And, and to your point, you know, are we going to use it for good or evil uh, is an interesting dilemma. And I think from a humble perspective, I guess we're all going through that journey, right? But I think I, I'd, I'd really like to get uh, Mr. Alabebe's uh, view on it. Uh, what's, your, what's your take from a framework perspective? Because you guys done some great work around frameworks and regulatory components, at least on the initial stage. Uh, what's your thoughts there? Um, actually, the other day I was reading a, an article um, about putting your pause on AI um, because there is uh, that concern about creating supercomputers um, and then basically running, you know, before humans could catch up in terms of regulation. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. Um, I think I'll leave it to everyone to, um, to think about that. Um, and you are right. I mean, regulations are there. Um, however, what we often find is the enforcement. I think we've just now in South Africa experienced um, 
the, our, our regulatory taking action um, with, um, it's in the news, with the Department of Justice on data bridges. So the regulations are there from a data privacy point of view. Um, in terms of many other facets that come with Web3 technology, smart contracts, um, I think it's still work is, being, is still being done. I think like you, my concern is it often takes long to enforce these regulations, especially in South Africa. I think um, in, in, in the UK, in, in the EU, they have done better in terms of enforcement. Uh, but in South Africa, the enforcement has taken long. And what tends to happen as humans, we test the waters until we see that actually you know, the regulators are going to take action if we break the laws. So from a social, um, social impact point of view, Web3 was really meant to level the playing field in terms of the haves and the have-nots, access to, um, to the economy. Um, is it working that way without... Um, regulators protecting the vulnerable, I don't think we will see that happening. What we will see with any emerging technology is that the criminals are always at the forefront. I think we've seen it with, with cryptocurrency. Right now, most of the time, if you hear about a kidnapping, they want you to pay in Bitcoin because it's not traceable, you know. Um, so there are, I think we are still grappling with, with, with regulations and the social impact. Um, but on the other hand, there's also a lot of good use cases uh, for Web3 technology. Um, I think you've spoken about the supply chain. Um, if, you, if you look at um, Kenya, for instance, they're doing a lot of work in, in terms of using um, Web3 to really reach the marginalized. So, you know, the scale is, is kind of, um, need to be balanced. It's not yet there. How long it will take, I really don't know. Um, but in terms of ISACA, what we do is to, uh, we do the research and we come up with, with frameworks as the, the technologies are being, um, are being developed so that we can help organizations, we can help governments um, to be able to put controls in place and it's up to the, uh, the organizations, the government, to put those controls in place, really. Excellent. It sounds like, do you take the red pill or the blue pill? Um, but uh, I think you wanted to come in there as well, potentially. So, so what I'm going to say is a bit strange. Um, to, to what you were saying there, I think the laws need to catch up with the technology. Yeah. I think we're, we're in the dark ages yeah. when we sure. think about some of the stuff. That doesn't stop bad actors. So that yeah. doesn't stop the people doing what's wrong. Mm. But we also need to, as a society, I, I, it's a viewpoint of mine, not of everyone, and it might be right or wrong. I don't think Popia and GDPR and data privacy, personal data privacy, is going to be a thing in the future. I think that's got a limited lifespan. I think what's going to probably happen is that the technology is going to overtake those concerns and the security is going to start being baked in rather than you having to need a regulation as such. So, you know, you, you, you're going to see a fundamental shift at some point um, where popia and stuff is no longer relevant. And to be honest, if someone has my face, okay, that's public, but, you know, my name, my email address, who cares? you know, at some point. And you, eventually it's going to get to that point. Yes, there will be bad actors, but the technology underpinning it should stop those bad actors happening. And, and you mentioned that the bad actors, the criminals are always ahead of us. I think that's changing. Uh, if that was true, especially in the banking and financial industry, we wouldn't have our industry because no one would trust us. Mm. So I think we, you know, I think we are ahead of the criminals in many ways. Doesn't mean that they don't find vulnerabilities. Um, but the technology does need to protect the underlying source 
And that's the business case we spoke about earlier, is that big companies, small companies, need to become more customer-centric and protect our customers. And by doing that and putting the technology implemented to do that, then those sort of things, even the laws start becoming less relevant because you can't break those sort of laws. It's very idealistic, I know. And it won't happen for a long time. In the meantime, we need to drive towards that. Excellent, thank you. I think mm -hmm. I saw another question. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Bosco Orens. I'm from the city of Johannesburg, but I'm also the chairperson of the Chartered CIO Council. So when it comes to Web 3.0, it's very interesting when you look at the three components that really makes it up. Um, and I'm simplifying, right? Uh, for, sorry for my three English. Nope. But it's basically machines trying to behave like humans do. Is the AI component to it and the language component. Now, South Africa is one of those countries where we've just adopted a 12th official language, which has no volume, has no sound, but says a lot. So when you listen to people that are otherwise enabled, we don't call them disabled anymore. So having deaf speak activated on Wave 3.0, um, what do you think some of the challenges that you might face utilizing the technology for that kind of customer dynamic? Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, any one of the panelists jump in? Yeah, if, if I may just come in. I mean, we, we've been working very closely with the CSR through the Mandala Mining Precinct, looking at, because in every technology that you do, especially when it's going to have an impact on people, yes. it's always good to then have at least at some level of collaboration from all the stakeholders and say, what is going to be the impact and how we're going to overcome it. And I think one of the learnings from the mining manufacturing sector is that the su successful application of technology centered around people speaks to that and say, you know, that impact, what is going to have and, and how people are going to react to it and that whole change management principle of how things are going to evolve. And I think that speaks to maybe the, some of the concerns that you raised of saying, you know, you, you can never leave people behind. And he mentioned, he's also mentioned it, that in everything we do, people need to always be there because you cannot just close the department because you think AI, AI is going to take over. So I think, you know, long term, we cannot run away from people. People will always play a bigger role in, the, in, in whatever technologies that are there and whatever artificial intelligence. I mean, I'll give you another practical example. One company was looking at... Um, moving from one premises to another. It's a manufacturing company, quite big. And they went to CSR and said, uh, how can you help us to streamline our manufacturing capacity? They were not talking about getting rid of people. They're saying, how do you optimize what we do? So they took that model and put it on a digital twin. And they came out there with a smooth factory. In actual fact, they ended up employing more people just by optimizing the operations on that digital twin. So technology is really not that bad. It's just how we apply it as people and thinking beyond just the impact it has on, on, on people. Excellent. And I agree. I think if you look at where we are, AI and blockchain is not going away. I think we mentioned it earlier. So I think it's also our responsibility to put that social aspect at the forefront and really keep that at the forefront of our thinking as we deploy new changes and new adaptation to these technologies. Excellent. Um, there's, there's a couple more questions. The light is in my eye, so I'm going to go with the gentleman in the back with the hand up. Okay. Is there a lady? There's, a lady yes. there's yes. two. There's a lady and a gentleman. Let's start with the lady, no problem. Okay. Um, so this uh, question is to Lisa Onolo. Um, there was a time where South Africa, you know, held the status of being uh, in the forefront of innovation um, in mining. We used to win, you know, global awards for our technology innovation in mining. Do you think um, that there's a way that we can reclaim um, that position? And if so, um, what are your views on how we can do that? Since mining is, you know, a bedrock um, for our economy um, in this country. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch your name, but thank you very much for that question. Look, you know, there's always this analogy that's been made that for everything that you have, it's either mined or planted. But, you know, uh, coming back to the issue of innovation in South Africa, especially in the mining space, I mean, we, we are now have a department called Department of Science and Innovation. And I think government was quite deliberate with, with that term because 
without having to look at the technology that's happening around us and trying to embrace it and be part of it, we're always going to be at the, on hindsight. And but the problem with innovation speaks to the issue of issues of IP, because if I've got my IP, I can take my IP anywhere. And that speaks also to the issues of manufacturing. So what has happened in the past, especially in the mining space, and I think it happens sometimes in other sectors, is that the, the then Chamber of Mines, which is now the Minerals Council, used to have their own research facility, which looked at anything that's got, that's got to do that the mines said, we've got a challenge with this problem, then they used to bring it to them. But that has now changed because after the 2008 recession and then we had the 2012 uh, commodity decline, the, everybody looked at the South African mining industry and said, the, the industry is dying. And the guys said, the geologists said, no, it's, it's not dying. We've got so much uh, coal, being the swear word lately, we've got so much uh, PGMs, and how can we say the industry is dying? How do we then re re redefine the future of mining in South Africa? And one of the things that was done was the formation of the Mandela Mining Precinct, which is a, a collaboration of the best uh, triple P that we've ever found, is that it's a collaboration between the Department of Science and Innovation and the Minerals Council, co-funded by, by, by both, to make sure they look into research and development in the mining space. So there's a huge committee that sits there, it, that's, that's uh, it's called, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of acronyms, it's called the SAMEDI Committee, which is a South African Mineral Extraction Research Development and Innovation Committee. In that you find Department of Science and Innovation, DMRE, Treasury, DTIC, ASSES, MEMSA, and the Manila Mining Precinct to go to the Minerals Council as a committee that looks at innovation and R&D in mining. So yes, there was a bit of a lull, but we've resuscitated it, and as you can even see it with our statistics on health and safety that it has been improvement. And there has been some improvement also in the mining sector in terms of productivity. So innovation is starting to happen again, and the government and the private sector, they're really pushing for it. So yes, there was a bit of a lull, but now even in the CSIR, they have even went and said that that eye, which speaks to the industry, has been dead. They have been more focused on research, so they have now reached out and uh, started to engage the industry more. And, and I'm, I'm one of the fortunate people that I'm sitting in one of the first uh, industrial advisory panel of the CSIR that speaks to you know, what the CSR is doing and what is coming out of the CSR that goes into the industry. So, and a CSR speaks from banking to military to mining, so that's, they, look, they look at everything. But there's always interaction in all the different departments in terms of the technologies that can be used somewhere else, can be transferred somewhere else. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. I see uh, we're on overtime already. Um, so if you have any further questions, I mean, please feel free to reach out to, to the panel members uh, after, after our session. And, uh, you know, it's really about working together, you know, not from a, only from a South African perspective, but from an African perspective, and really going through the humility of change, R&D, ETC, ETC. But I think, uh, you know, I want to thank the audience for, for taking the time to, uh, to embrace uh, some of the dynamic conversation that we had. I want to thank our panel members as well, so just a round of applause for everyone.